Hello all, this is Alan. Today is Friday, September 16th, 2011, and today is Science Friday. Today's video is going to come in three parts. One, welcoming Allison. Two, updating my own realm of existence. Three, Science Friday. One, welcome to the Ninja Nerds, Allison. We hope you do well. We do. Uh, we definitely do need a book nerd around these parts because, you know, book nerds are good. I'm not a book nerd, I'm a science nerd, so, but I still love book nerds nonetheless. So, welcome on board, you better stay a while. Two, this is where I give you a brief spiel about how things are going in my realm of existence. You really do not want to be tutoring pre-med students in the art of chemistry. Thing is, they are way too bloody obsessed with memorizing everything. And you would think that being people who want to go into the field of medicine, they would start becoming obsessed with actually thinking about what is physically going on in reality. And trust me when I say, memorization has nothing to do with considering what is physically going on in reality. It's just annoying. Every day, every student, what's the best method of memorizing this? memorizing that, what's the best way of uh, memorizing the equation for Gibbs free energy, what's the best method of memorizing uh, if a reaction will go or not. It's so annoying. Ah. My classes are going very annoyingly. My statics class, which is an engineering course, is just, yeah, it's kind of like physics only annoying. <laughs> it's, um, uh, textbook is too wordy. They can simplify the wording of it way too much. In chapter two alone, they could shave a good five pages by short, uh, giving uh, equivalent statements that would be more easily understandable. Uh, my math courses are too easy, though I am learning stuff in them. They're just still too easy. That is really annoying for me. Uh, my, uh, Hazmat class is an online course, which means it's very hard to get uh, organize a study group for it. So right now, as it stands, end of week three, my classes are very annoying. Also, in non-academic news, I have a date on Sunday. I, and the, the woman I have a date with, oh my god, she is amazing. Like, a lot, a lot. And just like, ah, how can a brain be that sexy, you know? It's like, she's, she's beautiful, sexy brain. She's co-founder of Born and Raised Productions. She's a stage performer. Oh my god. Just wow. And how the hell can I score something like that? I mean, it's like one of those things. She may as well be a goddess standing to, next to me. And I'm, I have a date with her. I'm just... Ah. Yes, that's my happy dance. And now everybody up in here thinks I'm insane. I don't care. <clears throat> Three. 
Science Friday. I got a comment in my last video requesting exothermic and endothermic reactions and if I had time, explosions. I will not have time to do explosions today. I'm already reaching my 15 minute mark just with the Science Friday portion and just no time. But I do have time for exothermic and endothermic, and all of my references will be put in the dealing with Bob. So, there you have it. Okay, let's start off with exothermic reactions. Right here. Uh, what exothermic reactions are is uh, they, they are chemical reactions that produce energy, that releases energy into the environment. Now, humans, creative as we are, intelligent as we are, have found out ways to take advantage of uh, the energy released by exothermic chemical reactions, including, but not limited to, gasoline vehicles. Uh, what goes on is, basically, you got yourself a gasoline-air mixture. The gasoline vaporizes, uh, goes into the chamber, spark plug goes off, explosion. We take, uh, we convert chemical potential to chemical uh, energy to kinetic energy, which moves your car forward. Uh, the chemical reaction is the uh, chemical formula which you of the fuel that you happen to use plus air yields carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and water vapor, and if you have a messed up carburetor, soot. Uh, soot is a byproduct byproduct of a messed up carburetor because the carburetor is what controls the fuel to air ratio and if it's busted it'll be too rich in fuel therefore not enough oxygen therefore uh, there's not going to be enough oxygen to produce water and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide so they have that and the energy released by that chemical reaction makes your car go forward. Behold the chemistry magic that controls your life. Now let's talk about endothermic reactions. These are chemical reactions that absorb energy from the surroundings. They require energy, typically in the form of heat, but not always, to go forward. Cooking is a perfect example of this. Uh, when you put a steak on the grill, you typically have burning coals in there, or propane, depending on the uh, grill you have. Uh, and the heat from the burning of whatever source of heat you got uh, goes into the steak <coughs> and what happens is uh, da -da -da. proteins combine chemically unsaturated fats become saturated chemically and sugars and uh, carbohydrates are formed chemically these are the three most prevalent reactions in steak, but they're not the only reactions in the cooking of steak. And all the chemical reactions going on in the cooking of steak, those chemical reactions directly cause the steak to brown perfectly outside and inside and causing it to be damn delicious, which is weird coming from a vegetarian, but, you know, it is what it is, what it is, what it is. And, 
discussing endothermic and exothermic reactions, I always have to bring up chemical potential energy, which is the energy stored in a compound which has the potential of being released through the process of chemical reaction. Um, I have that mis uh, written. Yeah. Uh, now, now both endothermic reactions and exothermic reactions have the uh, uh, take advantage of potential energy. Uh, endothermic reactions bring in heat to produce compounds that have higher potential energy. And what exothermic reactions do is take high potential energy compounds, reacts them, releases the potential energy, and creates new compounds. Uh, this whole uh, circular bit uh, is taken advantage of by us in what we call batteries. Now chemical uh, batteries, what they do is they take two compounds put in energy to create a third compound and this third compound has high potential energy. These two compounds that we started out with have low potential energy. This third one has high potential energy. And when we need to, we give a little spark to the battery and that produces the uh, reaction that runs the reaction of compound 4 and compound 5 and it releases energy. Now, I'm pretty sure most of you have not encountered chemical batteries. Uh, the electronic, like ion batteries that we have today, like for example, the battery that's in this phone right now. Uh, take advantage of the same thing, potential energy, only it's not chemical potential energy, it's more electric potential energy. You plug it in, in the laptop, in the, the wall, wherever, and electricity flows through the battery. Uh, the more you let, uh, the longer you leave it in there, the more electrical potential energy you got in there, uh, and the more electrical potential energy you have in there, the more charged your phone is. Uh, when we say my phone's about to die, that means literally uh, the electrical potential energy of the battery in here is approaching zero. Uh, and basically what's going on is you have it and when you have it plugged in, you're running an endothermic process. You're bringing a net energy into the system that is the phone. And when you uh, unplug it and start using it, uh, you're running an exothermic process, running your battery down. All right, that is it for Science Friday. Next week, I will do explosions and explosives. Chris, I will see you on Monday. Alex, I'll see you on Tuesday. Allison, I will see you on Wednesday. DFTBA, this is 
Alan, the A-Brain, your Mr. Security 702.